Welcome back to Choices. On this show, we interview healthcare practitioners and we interview them and discuss with them the choices that they offer for us in our healthcare. Now, many of us know about calcium and vitamin D, and it's become a very important part of our healthcare program. But what we're about to find out today is if not taken appropriately, it can actually become detrimental to our health. So, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Kate Rion Blue. She's a naturopathic physician an author and a lecturer, and the book you've written is Vitamin K2 mm -hmm. and the Calcium Paradox. That's right. A little known vitamin that could save your life. That's right, yes. Wonderful, good. Um, let's start off, what do you mean by a, the Calcium Paradox? What is that? Well, this is the situation, paradoxical situation, in which we need calcium for good health. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. But what's starting to come out uh, from research, studies looking at the fact that calcium, it's a double-edged sword. It can be harmful for us as well if it lands in the wrong places. Okay. So many people are taking calcium supplements, and even those who are just getting calcium from food find that uh, it's accumulating in arteries, other soft tissues, leading to kidney stones, um, hardening of the arteries, calcification of art, heart valves, and areas where it's very dangerous for our health. Mm -hmm. So the calcium paradox is how do we get the calcium into our bones and teeth where we need it and not risk it landing in places where it's causing us harm. Right, and that's what I gather most people are taking calcium, magnesium, and vitamin D4 is bone health. That's right. So your findings are suggesting that's not happening. Uh, well, the findings are suggesting that, well, findings definitely show that that's helpful for bones, but what more and more studies are showing that is that it may be harmful for your heart. And so the studies that have shown that people who take calcium supplements are have more heart attacks and strokes, and we're talking like 20 to 30 percent more heart attacks oh, and strokes. Quite, than those quite significant. Are quite significant. Okay. Uh, now, there have been studies going back and forth saying, yes, it does this, no, it doesn't. Uh, but I think on the whole, it's showing that calcium supplements are a concern. But the bigger picture is that um, whether or not you're getting calcium from supplements or your food, calcium can land in the wrong places. So we know that heart attacks and strokes, and again, heart attacks caused by hardening of the artery, which is this depositing of calcium, right. is the number one killer for both men and women. And that's whether you're not uh, you're taking a calcium supplement. So we know that calcium can get into the wrong places, right. um, but it's not calcium's fault. Yeah. And so the big focus when these studies came out is, well, should or shouldn't people be taking calcium? And people are confused. You know, I've mm -hmm. had people coming up to say to me, my osteoporosis doctor has told me to stop taking calcium. Absolutely stop it. But my general practitioner said, he's crazy, you need to take a calcium supplement. <laughs> so people are actually really confused. And, and hence the reason why we've got you on the show. Yes. We're hoping to clear that up today for everybody, because I know I've, I've had the same thing. People ask me how much, and when, and, and how. So mm -hmm. let's talk about a few of those things. I understand that in your research, you found that vitamin K2 was the missing link. Exactly. So it's not about whether or not we should be taking calcium. We, we get it into our bodies all the time. Mm -hmm. but. The, the key is to utilize it, so get it to get into our bones and stay there, mm -hmm. and stay out of our arteries and our you know, you know, other soft tissues. Mm -hmm. And that's what K2 does. It's a vitamin that has um, only really recently been appreciated as playing this role in guiding calcium around the body. It does other things for our health as well, okay. but this the main role is taking calcium, um, directing it into our bones, and not just preventing it from depositing, but even clearing it out and reversing inappropriate well, tissue it calcifications. It, it will reverse. Yes, yes. Studies have shown that, okay. animal studies, and now some human trials that have come out very recently, as well as, um, you know, I've seen this in practice. Okay. Yeah. So that's good news for all of us that have been taking uh, vitamin D for many years, but no K2. That's right. That's very, especially important because there's been so much good news about vitamin D. D helps us absorb calcium. But once the calcium is absorbed, there, D has no control over where the calcium goes. So some of it will get into the bones, for sure, we know that. Uh, but some of it will end up in places where we don't want it to be. And K2 will, will correct that problem. Okay, excellent. What um, got you interested in this enough to write a book? Oh, well, you know, I kind of tuned in to the emerging research on K2 uh, several years ago. Actually, I had written, uh, read, rather, uh, Weston Price's Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Mm -hmm. Quite a book. Quite a book. thought it was fascinating, you know, medical anthropology and nutrition. And it was some months later that I started to read about some studies about this vitamin K2, and I really thought that Price had spoken about this in his book. And I went back to get the book and looked at it and 
strangely enough, found nothing in there about that. Okay. Um, and then a very short time later, read a brilliant article linking vitamin K2 to Price's Activator X. Mm. And that is when kind of the light came on and I realized um, this is a nutrient that's been overlooked and misunderstood for a long period of time, even though it was sort of discovered a long time ago. A long time ago, yeah. Okay. And there was an enormous amount of really interesting modern research about this nutrient and, and great health benefits, and uh, yet nobody was talking about it. So mm -hmm. I realized there was a really interesting story to be told there. Good for you. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to get K2 into their diet, mm -hmm. let's talk first about the natural sources. Where would one go to get natural vitamin K2? There's two main sources. The first one is grass-fed animal foods. Okay. So um, dairy products, butter in particular, this is a fat-soluble vitamin, so mm -hmm. we find it in, in the fat of foods. So butter, egg yolks, and the fat and organ meats of animals that are out on the pasture. So when animals are eating green foods, they produce a lot of vitamin K2, which goes into, into their tissues right. that we can then consume. So grass-fed. Grass-fed. So that's important, folks. If you're not eating grass-fed, you're not going to be getting a, a viable source of vitamin K2. Right. It's very important. Grass-fed eggs and butter. And we know that these foods can be hard to come by, you know, especially in Canada in the winter time. Mm -hmm. Even if you have a source of uh, nice uh, pastured chickens, grass-fed chickens, mm -hmm. uh, in the winter, that we still have to look for other sources. So, the other source of vitamin K2 is certain types of fermented foods. So, uh, there are bacteria that produce vitamin K2. So, some of the highest food. This is always good news. Some of the highest foods of vitamin K2 include cheese. Yeah. Gouda and brie cheese. Okay. Um, you know, all the cheese lovers just said Yahoo. All the cheese, yes, they said <laughs> cha-ching. Uh, new, new research shows that some types of blue cheese, there, there's the bigger variety with blue cheese, actually. I didn't mention that in the book. That's very new information. Uh, okay. You know, Gouda and brie are always made of the same bacteria. Okay. Um, blue cheese, it, it varies. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. to be honest, you know, the ultimate heart-healthy snack is probably brie and a glass of red wine. Okay. You know. Um, you just made uh, everybody's day. <laughs> <Yeah, that's right. laughs> now I understand also, uh, you and I were speaking last night, natto. Natto, yes. So this is another fermented food. Uh, traditional Japanese breakfast food, it's a fermented soybean. That's mm -hmm. the highest known food in vitamin K2. Okay. And so it's the bacteria that ferment the natto. For example, you don't find any K2 in miso or tempeh, which are other types of fermented mm -hmm. soy foods, but natto is extremely high in K2. So it depends on the bacteria that's doing the fermenting. That's right. That's why not all cheeses are high. Most cheeses have some, but right. okay. there's, you know, there's a variation. Okay. As we were uh, discussing last night, the importance of uh, organic natto. Could you talk about that a little bit, speak to that? That's important for a few reasons. So we, well mainly because we know there's concerns around GMO. Mm -hmm. And um, so organic natto, if you can source with organic soybeans, find your natto, mm -hmm. then those are, I believe by definition, GMO free. They are so far. Yes. Now that's hard to come by and I think uh, you'd be a better person to fill mm -hmm. in where people can get organic mm -hmm. natto, it can mm -hmm. be tough to find. Yeah, it's actually available, um, I found one source at Fujia off of Shelburne. They do have a, uh, an organic natto. And also, uh, on the island here, we're blessed with quite a bit of bison. And bison have the, the sensibility not to eat grains. You uh, can't feed yes. a bison gr a grains, they will only eat grass. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of um, retail stores on the island in southern Vancouver Island here that do sell bison. That's wonderful, and and grass-fed uh, meat for people who are looking for meat is an important source. But we have to keep in mind that grass-fed meat tends to be lean, mm -hmm. and this is a fat-soluble vitamin. So I do recommend. There's lots of benefits to eating grass-fed meat. You know, mm -hmm. more omega threes and lots of other things. Mm -hmm. But it's where the, the the fat's where it's at. You know, when it comes okay. to K two, so you right. need something uh, organ meats or other richer cuts. Okay. So if somebody wanted to supplement with it, then what would you look for? What would you want to look for when you're buying it off the shelf? Mm -hmm. What's important? So K2 supplements are uh, relatively new uh, to Canada, just in the last few years, mm -hmm. and there's a few things to know when you're shopping for them. There are two types of vitamin K2 that you'll find on the market, and uh, they both work, they just need to be taken in appropriate doses. In Canada, we're limited to the amount of vitamin K2 we can get in a product, so I recommend people look for something called MK7. It'll be somewhere, you know, small on the label. Mm -hmm. And this is a form of vitamin K2 that is naturally derived from natto, this uh, Japanese uh, fermented okay. soy food. Mm -hmm. And so it's effective in a relatively small dose. 120 micrograms is typically what you'd find in a, in a product. Okay. When I wrote the book, 
uh, I was recommending one of those a day, 120 micrograms. Since then, I've increased my recommendation to, um, well, one is good for general health maintenance, two to three if you have a condition uh, like osteoporosis or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is 350 micrograms um, is what you'd get in one serving of natto. So if you're eating a serving of natto per day, mm -hmm. that's about how much K2 you'd be getting. And when you say a serving, uh, what I read in some of your literature was, is that an ounce and a half? An ounce and a half is, is what you get in the little uh, styrofoam pods, yeah. typically those, okay. that's a, one small normal serving mm -hmm. of natto. Okay. All right, excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and how often would you take it? Once a day, twice a day? That you can take once a day. That's okay. another advantage to this MK7 or this bacterial derived form. is mm -hmm. has a long half-life. You can take it once a day. stays okay. in the blood. Very convenient. Now, the 7 denotes the length of the amino chain? Yes, that's right. Okay. The sort of length of the okay. molecule. And the other one is the MK4, and that's synthetic? Right. So MK4, this is a synthetic form of, of vitamin K2. A lot of the early studies were done on MK4. We know that it works and it's safe, even though it's synthetic, but it needs to be taken in far higher doses. Mm -hmm. um, 45,000 micrograms is, is what is was typically used in the studies. It's quite a bit more. It's quite a bit more, uh, but how there's new studies that have come out this year that show it being effective in far lower doses, but still you're looking at um, 1,500 micrograms. Okay. It's only it's quite a bit lower than what was being oh, used, but it's still time. far yeah. higher than what we can get in Canada. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, you decided to write this book. Mm. How's the book been going? Have you been reaching out and, and actually people starting to understand this now and, and pick it up more? Yes, it hasn't made the, the big impact I was hoping it would, but I, I know from the feedback I've been getting that for the people who have been reading the book and getting the message, it's been made a really important difference to their lives and to mm. their health. And I've had a number of uh, really positive emails of people with uh, you know, their, their bone density is increasing, uh, angina has stopped, and their cardiologist has said there's been a clearing of, of calcification in their heart vessels. And those are both huge. Those are huge. Those yeah. are huge. And these are the types of things we would call silent killer diseases that we think just kind of sneak up on us and mm -hmm. get us or not. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's nutritional, and, and this makes a big difference. So, okay. Yeah. What would somebody have to spend a month in cost to buy off the shelf uh, a therapeutic dose of K2. That's K2. a good question. I'd have to do a little bit of math. It's if I'm recommending three a day, two bottles, I would say a, a $30. $30 oh, well, a month. if you are dealing with angina yeah. or you've got some bone density issues, that's a small price to pay, especially when you compare it to Posamax and some of the other approaches yes. that are not yeah. quite so uh, affordable. Yeah, and, and the, you know, the, the bone density increase, uh, you know, fighting osteoporosis and clearing out your arteries is just the beginning. I mean, it helps with varicose veins, extremely important for uh, pregnant women and women who are nursing. In what uh, way for those? What does it benefit? This, this is really interesting. So uh, especially during pregnancy, vitamin K2 is very important for a proper facial bone and tooth development in the, the developing um, baby. So, it, um, and I do show pictures in the book of, you know, white, nice wide faces because mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. K2 governs that. Okay. And uh, tooth, I talk a little bit about a tooth structure. And then, uh, you know, very important during nursing and throughout childhood, it's been shown to be important for, for bone development and, and dental health. Dental health, yeah. wow. That could save us a lot of money in the years as we get older with how many bridges and crowns. And that's right, yeah. Amazing. And that's the first thing people will say, you know, these are all concerns that are um, deep within the body. You don't feel if your bone density is decreasing, no, you maybe no. picked up on, on a scan or... You, you know, typically people miss um, you know, the early signs of hardening of the arteries. So a lot of these things you can't tell, but uh, people will say that their teeth feel cleaner, that the plaque comes off their teeth, mm. and their dental hygienist will remark, oh, you're flossing more, or you're cleaning your teeth better, or something mm. like that. And K2 actually is secreted in the saliva and cleans the teeth. Wow. Yeah. So no more flossing. No, <laughs> so if somebody knew that they had some of these health concerns we've already spoken about, yeah. how much would they want to, you mentioned up as high as 300, would they want to do that for a period of time and then back off? Yeah, well, it's safe. K2 is non-toxic. This is good news. Uh, mostly when we hear about fat-soluble vitamins, we're familiar with vitamin A and vitamin D have toxic potential. But K2 is non-toxic, okay. so you could safely take it at higher doses for long periods of time if you want. Okay. Um, so in those conditions, or for people who know they have a history of heart disease, uh, or they have osteoporosis, I would say keep taking it at those levels. Mm -hmm. If you have a you know, bone scan and your density has gone up and you want to 
uh, reduce your dose, that's fine. Right. But okay. since it's non-toxic, then um, yeah, very safe and helpful. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. All right, we are starting to run out of time, so I'd like to thank you, Dr. Kate, for coming on the show. This is very important information. It's great to get it out, and I hope your book your book uh, your um, book takes off wonderfully. And I just bought a sailboat, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm... Boats on the brain. Boats on the brain, yes. I hope your book takes off and uh, reaches a lot of people, especially people who are struggling with some of these conditions that we've spoken about, that they can actually, at home, empower themselves on their own health journey recovery uh, without spending a lot of money on, on expensive uh, pharmaceuticals. Well, thanks for having me and helping to raise awareness of my book as well as vitamin K2 because it's an important nutrient and it will help a lot of people. Sure. Now, speaking of your book, where can people uh, find it? No, oh, it is sold at most health food stores that sell books will have this in store. It's certainly available on all the online, uh, you know, major bookstore so retailers, Amazon, and, Amazon and, and all wonderful. those. You can get that there. Excellent. Too. We will have the uh, an image of the book and the publisher's name uh, at the end of the show on the credits for those of you that are interested. So thank you very much. My name is Cameron Moffat. I'm an osteopathic practitioner here in Victoria, and on behalf of myself and the crew, I would like to thank you for coming on the show and sharing us with this, this information. Thank you folks for watching and until next time, stay healthy and we'll see you again. Goodbye. So Dr. Kate, what would be some of the symptoms? How would somebody know if they're uh, vitamin K2 deficient? Are there tests? Uh, would the physician know? How would that be found out? Well, their physician probably won't know. Okay. You know, if you have been diagnosed with osteoporosis, if you have varicose veins, uh, you've been diagnosed with any kind of arterial calcifications, kidney stones, these are all connected to vitamin K2 deficiency, uh, diabetes for example, okay. but they're not necessarily things you would notice. Um, if you have a heavy buildup of plaque on your teeth, that's a mm -hmm. sign that you're lacking K2 to keep your, your teeth clean. Okay. Uh, but there isn't a test per se. You know, all of these things are subtle, we're, we're used to them, um, and there isn't a, a blood test. The most useful blood test for vitamin K2 deficiency are really only being used in academic settings right now. They're not available through the practitioner. Okay. That's coming pretty soon. Okay. Um, but again, since you know, studies have come out, well, even when I, when I published my book, and then again uh, just a couple months ago, showing that K2 deficiency is widespread. Uh, mm -hmm. And that means that most apparently healthy adults don't have enough K2 to keep calcium in the place that it should be all the time, which means okay. we're slowly heading down the road towards either osteoporosis or heart disease. Okay. And uh, yes, so studies show it's widespread and it's non-toxic, so I would say don't wait for a test. Okay. So how did that happen? How was it that, I mean our grandparents, I don't think we're dealing with the same issues that we are now. No. I notice in my practice a lot of digestive, a lot of uh, hardening the arteries start showing up. Mm -hmm. What happened? Mm -hmm. uh, well, times have changed and diets have changed. and. Well, two big factors, the main one being removing animals from the pasture, so changing from primarily grass-fed or as much as possible to primarily grain feeding, mm -hmm. eliminated this nutrient, and since we didn't really know about the nutrient, weren't aware of it until relatively recently, was overlooked for a long period okay. of time, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know we were doing away with it. So that change, as well as eating less fermented foods over time, all of those will help contribute to healthy uh, bacteria and, and contain vitamin K2, and we're eating less of those than, so than our grandparents do. Sauerkraut? Sauerkraut is actually one of the things that are, are low. Mm -hmm. um, different types of uh, cheeses are the main ones, and I think there are a fair bit more foods out there that are high in K2 than we know of yet. Oh, okay. uh, we just need to do more testing. Okay. Yeah. So the, the ones I'm familiar with uh, would be sauerkraut, the cheeses, mm -hmm. uh, properly made yogurt. Mm -hmm. uh, kimchi, mm -hmm. uh, Korean pickled vegetables. Yeah, they haven't tested that. I, I, I imagine it would fall in a similar category to, to sauerkraut and that not being high, in, specifically in K2, but still, these fermented. are very fermented foods, very healthy things to have. Sure. Yeah. Now, um, speaking of fermented foods, would the bacterial health have any effect on the absorption of K2, vitamin K2? It does a little bit. So it turns mm -hmm. out that humans can, uh, our gut bacteria can make a little bit of its own K2. It's not absorbed particularly well. Okay. And we do convert, when we eat green leafy vegetables, which is a source of vitamin K1, we, we convert a very small amount of that to K2, mm -hmm. but in general, not enough to meet our own needs. We need to get it in through our diet in this preformed way. So we've got to break it in there.
we yes, have to bring it that's in. right. Okay. So I mentioned earlier on the island, we do have a lot of um, uh, bison. Mm -hmm. We also have a lot of um, organic milk here, mm -hmm. and a lot of local uh, companies making property fermented uh, yogurt. So they're fermenting it the you know the 24 hours period, not just the six hours. So would yogurt be another? consideration then for? Unfortunately, yogurt has tested <laughs> low. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's, I know, I know. Well, that, that shows that it's, you know, it's different bacteria have different capacities. Right. Cottage cheese is one that may be high. This was Dutch research, and I'm not sure if what they call curd cheese is the same curd, thing as what right. we call cottage cheese, but okay. uh, that one that is uh, something that came up high on the charts. But I think we just need to do more testing. More tests. So stick with the natto yep. or supplement. Mm -hmm. uh, off the shelf. Yeah, and gouda, brie, and mm -hmm. you know, blue cheese. And anything like grass fed. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any um, are there any companies out there that are are, are doing an exemplary uh, uh, effort at uh, supplementing K two, producing vitamin K two? I think that there are several. I mean, I really like the quality of the natto derived, these bacterial derived vitamin K2 supplements. So basically, you culture up this this natto, mm -hmm. you extract the vitamin K2 from it. And, and put it in a, in a supplement. And, and clinically, um, we're seeing very good results with these. Okay. So are there, any research. are there any particular companies that are doing that specifically, or are they mm -hmm. all doing the, the natural derived? Uh, no, they're not all doing natural derived, and that's why you want to look for NK7. I, you know, I like you know, the natural factors one. Uh, I've been using that myself. It's okay. a nice K and D combination. Okay. But if you look at the, at the fine print of, of the products, if it says NK7 on there somewhere, that's the natural derived form. Okay. Yeah. I've mentioned this to a few people in preparation to uh, doing the interview with you, and people have come back to me and said, mine doesn't have MK7 on it. So I guess there are some products out there that are not MK7. That's right, and there are there some that don't say what it is, which means you don't actually know what you're getting and okay. buying. And there are some that include vitamin K1, which isn't something you need to be paying for. It's extremely easy to get K1. Even if you just eat the parsley on the side of your plate once in a while, right, right. That's, that will give you vitamin that, enough okay. K1. Yeah. So don't buy it if you don't need it. No, that's right. Okay. Don't pay for it. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Thank you very much.